So, Jennifer asked me to introduce myself. <laughs> Hopefully, you signed up for this session, you read my bio. So, let me just give you a Cliff Notes version. Being uh, what HR folks refer to as a seasoned veteran, meaning I've been around a while, let me just tell you why I do what I do, why I'm passionate about this, why I wake up literally every day excited and blessed to do what I do. I got a chance, I've helped build three companies as an executive. In one of those runs, we, it was a 13-year run for me personally. We built a company from $5 million to $300 million. We did 11 acquisitions. Seven of them ended up under my purview and my leadership team's purview. 1,200 employees in seven offices around the country, 800 of those employees were hourly employees. We were able to build one of the most highly engaged workforces I've ever seen. I give my leadership team, our leadership team, the credit because they bought in on the vision and they bought in on what was possible. So when we sold the company in 2007 for $1.4 billion, I'm going to brag, uh, I stayed around for another year and went, I'm out of here. And I reinvented as a leadership consultant and executive coach. I was on my own for about six years. And um, somebody else upstairs had other plans. I didn't think I'd ever go back to work in a company again. But about five and a half years ago, uh, the CEO and owner of Impact Group knocked on my door and asked me would I come help and build one more company. And so I was president of Impact Group up until May of last year. We are a St. Louis-based global firm that has three lines of business. We are the largest global provider of spouse partner relocation, integration, and job search. So think Amazon. We took care of about 2,000 of their spouse partners last year as they were moving around the world. We do career transition or outplacement work and leadership development executive coaching. I stepped down last year as man to take on a title as managing director, so I still handle several accounts and I do coaching and facilitation for the company. So that's enough about Impact Group. I've got all kinds of certifications, you know, ICF, Berkman, brain-based leadership, you name it, um, because that's what lights me up. So thank you again for attending today. You ready to get started? We'll go back to this slide. Let me think. 29 years ago now, it's a Sunday morning, and I'm helping my daughter get dressed for church. As I lean over to buckle the first buckle of that little black patent leather shoe, she's seven, in her little tiny voice, she goes, Daddy, when you get dressed, do you put on sock, sock, shoe, shoe, or sock, shoe, sock, shoe? <laughs> You're thinking right now, how did they get there, right? And that was the same thing that happened to me. I was like, Erica, I have no clue. And I literally sat down on the edge of the bed and pulled up my pants, and I went, hmm, sock, sock, shoe, shoe, lace, lace, because that day, just like today, I have shoes with laces on them. And then she piped up again in that tiny voice and said, I do sock, shoe, sock, shoe. What's the point? Think about it. How many things have you done today already on autopilot, on auto magic? Our brains like efficiency. Our brains need efficiency, right? They build new, super neural highways. But the point when it comes, for us to think about this as it relates to leadership development is how, mo how much of what you're doing as a leader is on autopilot, where you're just showing up? Are you really getting intentional in thinking about your impact and your effect, not just on people out there, but on yourself, your self-awareness of who you are as a leader. So I just, you know, again, I've been telling this story for a long time, but think about it. A seven-year-old child recognized that she had a choice about something as simple as putting on socks and shoes. So my challenge for you today as we go through these three principles and then the bonus topic at the end on employee engagement is to really think about your own leadership and what you need to investigate and maybe reinvent and maybe challenge are you putting on your socks and shoes the right way? So let's roll into the three principles with the first principle. Before I do, let me just comment about the title. This is the synthesis for me of the last 10 years of doing leadership development work, executive coaching around the world. I think I've coached now over 300 executives in over 20 countries. And when I do workshops or I do a six-month project or a one-day or whatever it may be, 
I always ask this question, what are you taking away from our time together? What are you learning? What's your insights? You know, it's the Araya model, awareness, reflection, insight, and action. And these three principles I'm about to cover come up most often, where people go, wow, this has really changed who I am as a leader. So I began to pay attention to that a few couple of years ago as it, as it just be- began to become obvious this was really having an impact on people. So this is what I'm going to share with you. Let me also do this so I can keep up with the time. Because I know I'm going to get a 10-minute warning from Jennifer, but... Do you need me to do a 20-minute No, no. No, we're fine. We're fine. Leadership begins with your beliefs. Now, there are several different segments we could go down today. I'm only going to go down two. But when we think about our beliefs and how powerful they are, They really control everything that we have and everything that we do and everything that we become. But rather than believe me, let's look at what a very noted person says about your beliefs. They become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Habits become your values. Values become your destiny. Pretty profound when you think about it. Here's a question. Where did your beliefs come from? What do you believe about yourself and your potential? What do you believe about others and their potential? What do you believe about the world? Again, we could go down this path for the next half hour. But recognize that what you believe is true. Here's what Henry Ford said. If you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. So recognize the power of your beliefs. And how it relates to leadership development and talent management is this. What do you believe about the people that you are fortunate enough to lead? I heard Josh Burson recently say the war for talent is over. Talent has won. There's over 7 million job openings and only 6 million people looking. You're going to have to hire people that don't have all of the skills, knowledge, and expertise. But if you're not in a growth mindset... And if you're not familiar with that, Carol Dweck is the leading authority on the growth mindset. Microsoft transformed their culture by turning it into a growth mindset culture. This is what we need to do as leaders is begin to look at the people with that positive growth mindset. So with that in mind, as it relates to leadership development, here's a question for you. Is talent... So first... Do you believe that leadership development is a talent? Do you believe being a leader is a talent? Do I get some head bobs? Yeah. Do you think that the majority of leadership development then is nature or nurture? How many believe over 50% of leadership development is nature? You're born to be a leader. How many have heard that statement before, right? Anybody believe that it's over 50% nature? No hands? So then the rest of the hands, how many of you believe 50% nurtured? Keep the hands up. How about 70% uh, nurtured? 90? Only a few hands still left. One of the leading authorities on this topic is Anders Ericsson, who has written actually a collection of research in his own research of about 1,000 pages. He's considered the father of talent development and the father and the, and the thinker on the 10,000 hours to master something. And what he believes is 95% of talent is developed. It's not born. If we stop and think about that, it's a little sobering, isn't it? Are we really achieving everything that we can be? If 95% is developed, then how do we do that? Well, the synthesis of his research is this, besides the 10,000 hours. Practice, practice with a coach, and deliberate practice. How many know what deliberate practice is? Anybody? It's what we as adults, I'll own it first, struggle with. It's doing things we don't know how to do. So if you think about learning a new talent, Many of us, if we're all, uh, honest, have tried new things and maybe stopped because it gets real uncomfortable. 
We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable if we're going to really develop our talent and our skills. Let me ask this question. How many are a little bit challenged, though, that 95% of talent is developed? Be honest. Anybody want to raise the hand? My hand is up, by the way. I'm talking about it, but I'm challenged by it. Here's my belief. I believe that there are certain things that we are born with. There are some nature things, i.e. hand-eye coordination, for example. Tiger Woods, I believe, if his father had put a tennis racket in his crib, would have been one of the greatest tennis players that ever walked the face of the earth. But his father put a golf club. Uh, my wife is an LPGA teaching professional. Annika Sorenstam, one of her heroes, one of the greatest female golfers ever, played competitive tennis till she was 12 and then flipped sports. So I do think that there are some things that are nature, that we're born with, that, that then we can add on the talent development. So it's not all about the talent development. And the last point, too, is there's windows of opportunity. So I used to play basketball as a kid. Let's say tomorrow I woke up and told my wife, Eva, I want to be an NBA professional basketball player. Is that going to happen? I don't care what I believe. It ain't happening, right? I'm five foot eight on a good day. I'm 67 years old, and I'm not going to become an NBA basketball player. So we have these windows of opportunity that sometimes pass us by. So just recognize that your beliefs about what you're capable of and the recognition that you probably are not maximizing, and I'll speak to myself, not maximizing all that you can be. Those beliefs that we have keep us safe. We make up excuses why we can't get that extra degree or we can't go for that next, that next role. Now, there's another piece of the beliefs. I am not a microbiologist, and I didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn last night. How many have heard of this topic? Epi is outer. Genetics is your DNA, the gene code. A very short version of a long story is DNA was discovered in the 1890s. In the 1950s, Watson and Crick, two gentle, English gentlemen, discovered what it looked like, the double helix. And they promptly went into an English pub, lifted a pint, and said, we've discovered the secret of life. Then fast forward, in the early 2000s, with computerization, they were, the scientists were finally able to unravel the genetic code, over six billion pieces of information. And again, proclaim we found the secret of life. But something happened along the way. And over the next three or four years, they began to notice that what they had hypothesized was not coming true. And here's what it is. If you think about Magic Johnson, if you're familiar with him, a former great NBA player, he has the HIV virus in his system. But he's never contracted the disease. And what microbiologists like Bruce Lipton, who wrote a book called the, um, uh, the biology of belief. Well, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a slog. It's a, written by a microbiologist, but it's a, it, it will amaze you. People like Bruce Lipton and others now believe that your DNA is not fixed. They have been able to prove in the lab that your DNA can be influenced by your mind, by people around you, and your environment. Another great book, if you really want to explore the mind, in a deeper way is A Mind to Matter by Dawson Church. And he cites a lot of experiments that have been done. Here's the point, is that you, if, think about it, if you have the ability to change your DNA with your thinking and your environment and the people that you hang around with, what else can you do? And I'll leave this section with one quick story. My brother, about five years ago, a little less than five years ago, was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. And as soon as he heard the diagnosis, he immediately looked at the oncologist and said these words, I do not want you to tell me how long you think I'm going to live. He said, you better tell your entire team that no one is going to predict my lifespan. You tell me what the protocol is, and we will do it, and we will keep going through day by day. But you let everybody on this team know no one had better ever tell me how long I'm going to live. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your family or friends or whatnot, but the typical life cycle for stage four liver cancer is six months. 
He lived four and a half years. Now, he fought and he fought, but he refused to believe and let somebody else put in their belief system about his future and his destiny. So again, we think about ourselves and becoming that next level leader and what we are doing and how we can grow, but also how do we affect others? Recognize that how you are is affecting others, literally affecting people's DNA. That's pretty incredible when you stop and think about it. So that leads us to the next principle. Leadership is 24-7, 365. The way I like to say that's the double negative. You're never not leading. So again, this is the feedback I've gotten from leaders and executives and people that I've coached. I never realized this before, that everything you think, do, and say is being observed. It's being absorbed by those people around you. So how are you showing up? What are you bringing into the office? So it, how many have done any research or reading on brain-based leadership or neuro-leadership? So what is the number one job of the brain? Keep you alive. Keep you alive. Right. Yeah, we, we are the descendants not of Betty and Barney, who would come out of the cave in the morning and go, oh, look at the sky, it's blue, and look at the flowers blooming. Those ancestors were eaten. We are the ancestors of Fred and Wilma, who came out and looking to see the danger, and Fred would put his ear on the ground to see if he could hear the thundering footsteps of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, and if he did, he'd run back in the cave. So our brains are hardwired to keep us safe and to keep us alive. What has this got to do with leadership? So how many are familiar with the Google study, Aristotle, on what makes great teams? This is the data from them with the number one reason for high-performing teams is the creation of psychological safety. It's creating that environment where we feel safe to be vulnerable. If you're familiar with Brene Brown's work on courage and vulnerability, this is where it can start, how it can start. I have a certification from the Academy for Brain-Based Leadership in Brain-Based Leadership, and this is their model, though, because if we look at this room of about 30 people and we just say that psychological safety is what we all need, each of us defines that differently. And the model that they use is that the five things they believe are important are security, autonomy, fairness, esteem, and trust. And if each of us were to take the time, and they actually have an assessment that you can take, and the people that know me and have known me for a long time, my number one psychological safety element is autonomy. I want to be free. I, want to, I don't want to be micromanaged. So that's my number one. So recognize that each of us has a different profile as well. So it's not just enough to recognize that as a leader, we want to create an environment where people feel safe. We need to know how's the best way to know that. If you're not going to take them through the assessment, how can you find out? Anybody have an idea? Talk to people. Ask. What's important to you? When I'm leading you or when we're working together, what am I doing that's working for you? What am I doing that may not be working for you? What could I do that would empower you more? It, it really involves those one-to-one -one conversations as we move toward recognizing also the pain and danger model of our brain seeking safety, 80% of us, if we're not careful, if we don't investigate our socks and shoes, we will play not to lose because of that negative bias. But fortunately, there's two parts of our brain, the hardware and the software, the software we call the mind's eye, where with intentional focus and effort and desire, passion, vision, goals, we can architect and design what it looks like to play to win for ourselves and for others. Now, the model of leadership that I have been exposed to for the last 10 years, and I'm privileged to coach at IMD in Switzerland, at Lausanne, Switzerland, um, in the number one leadership program there called High Performance Leadership, was from my mentor, Dr. Cole Reeser. It's called Secure-Based Leadership. And it really, I think, defines what brain uh, psychological safety really looks like in a bigger way, in a better way. But a secure base is a person, place, goal, or object that provides a sense of protection, gives a sense of comfort, and offers a source of energy and inspiration to explore, take risks, and seek change. 
How many of you would like more innovation and creativity in your organizations? This model, if we look at it, what happens with the strength of you becoming a secure based leader for yourself, but then for the people around you, where you're turning off that negative bias, this is what it looks like. There's many versions of secure bases. The two major ones are people and goals. We also know, in fact, um, um, if, how many know who Howard Ross is? The, he's considered the father of unconscious bias. He, just, he has a new book out called Our Search for Meaning. He talks about belonging. That's also a fundamental thing that our brains want. They, our brains need, we're tribal. We want to belong. And so this is what we're talking about from the standpoint of you as a leader being a secure base for yourself but the people around you to create this environment where they know that you care about them, you're bonded with them to the point where they know they belong and that you love them. Okay? And the other is the goals that we have. And if we can create that environment for ourselves and the people that we're blessed to lead, then the exploration and innovation will occur is what we believe because it creates that empowerment and the self-esteem for the people. So you have a handout at your table. Let me check my time. So look at a couple of these. Um, when I do this, oftentimes when people will say, Ed, how can a disaster be a secure base? Well, I was coaching in California a few years ago and I had a guy in my program that had been at a um, hotel in Santa Cruz in the, the big earthquake hit in, was it 1987? The one where the baseball game was being broadcast, I think. 89, thank you, 89. And he was at this hotel, he was the general manager, and their hotel was affected and hit by the earthquake. And he said for him, that event was unbelievable because it showed what he was capable of in a crisis and also what his team was capable of because they had to take care, I don't know, 150 or whatever the number of guests were at that particular hotel in that particular day. So that's how a crisis can literally be something I can go back on and know that in a moment where I'm challenged without necessarily the skills or the knowledge, I've never been trained to handle an earthquake, um, he responded and his team responded. But when we think about our experiences, our marriage maybe, our university, oftentimes boarding school can be a secure base or not. Anybody in the room here go to boarding school? Yeah. Well, sidebar, George's work on secure base leadership is based off of John Bowlby's work on attachment theory, which he himself, John Bowlby, was sent to a boarding school at the age of seven. And his takeaway from that was no child should ever be sent to boarding school until they're eight. I'm going, what? I'm not so, but it was such a profound experience for him. He recognized the impact, impact on him that that's what he spent his life researching was children and the environments they were raised in and how they grew up to be adults and what it was like when they were growing up. Did they have that strong mother and strong father relationship? And then George took that work and applied it to his work as a hostage negotiator. He's been held hostage four times and still lived. Uh, yeah. I know. What are the chances? But, 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 but it, yeah, yeah, don't hang. No, he's, he doesn't do hostage negotiations anymore, thank God. He just teaches the program in, at, at IMD. But think about some of these examples. And then you've got examples on one side of your handout. I'm going to put on a little bit of music for about two, two and a half, three minutes at the most. Think about some of the secure bases that you have in your life. Let me share one atypical with you very quickly. And I'm going to share a really crazy one after we do the debrief. This is my father's wedding band. My father passed away in 1999. And not long after he passed away, my mother gave me this wedding band. So this is a remembrance of my father literally every day. So it's amazing what can be a secure base for us. One of the coaches I work with in Switzerland was an Olympic swimmer for the country of England, of UK, the UK, Britain. And she has a, an Olympic necklace that her coach gave her. Um, that she still wears. She's in her 50s now. But it's her secure base of knowing what she was able to accomplish in her life. So secure bases can go way beyond people and goals. They can be symbols. You know, if you're, if you're a person of faith, whatever that faith may be, the Quran or, or the, the Jewish Bible or, or the Christian Bible, they can, those can be secure bases. So I'm going to put on a little music, take about two or three minutes, and think about your own secure bases. And then we'll do a quick debrief. When I unraveled my life through the process we do with executives at IMD, 
Uh, it was called The Roots of Leadership, where I looked at my lifeline. And I looked at the day I was born to the day I showed up at that program 10 years ago as a leader. It became obvious to me that the first five years of my life, my parents were not secure bases for me. My parents, it was a very dysfunctional home. Uh, I was in the middle of those two. I was the pet of both of them, so I was constantly, as they were fighting, and I didn't have a secure base in my life till we moved to Charleston, South Carolina, and my grandmother showed up in my life. And my grandmother became my rock, my secure base. And so one day, about four years ago, I walked into a Whole Foods, and I'm in the fruit section. I picked up a basket of figs, and I, just, and I get goosebumps now thinking about it. I went, oh, my God, figs are a secure base for me. And some of you are saying, Ed, we knew you were weird or thought you were weird. Now we know you're weird. But here's the story. My grandmother, I'd go stay at her house. It was the only place where I felt safe. And she had a fig tree out her back porch. And I'd walk out the back porch and go climb in the fig tree and sit there and eat figs until I was about to, to puke. <laughs> but today, I mean, I just love figs. So it's amazing what can be a secure base for us. Here's the piece I, in, in, what's your name? What, yeah, Lynn. Lynn. Lynn, you bring up something because apparently maybe you just lost a dog or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Re how many have seen a high performer in your organization or somebody you thought was a high performer and all of a sudden their performance dropped? We've all experienced that. Maybe you've even lived it yourself. Oftentimes, and I would put a percentage on it of at least 80% of the time, if you unravel and if you have that bonded relationship and you happen to be that person's leader, you can trace it to the loss of a secure base. A mother, a father, a grandparent, a child even. I was coaching an executive last year. One of his direct reports, her daughter was run over by a car. She didn't die, but it was amazing what these concepts helped Ron do to come alongside his employee in that moment of crisis. And I did a, another leadership program for 70 of those, that company's leaders back this summer. And that particular employee came up to me to say, thank you for the difference you made in Ron's life in that crisis that we went through with my daughter. So that's how secure-based leadership can show up. But recognize that if you've got somebody working with you and the performance is going down, there could be a loss here for them. It's very, very important to recognize the grief cycle and what happens to us when these things may go away. So let me finish up this section here, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a caring and daring model. So we ask the question sometimes, how caring should a leader be? 50%, 80%, 100%? What do you think? So I'm hearing 70 or 60 we believe, I believe, 100%. Now, I know what the comeback is, but, Ed, if I care too much, if I get too close to people, you know, what's going to happen? Well, here's the other side of that, the mind's eye, the positive, playing to win side of that. If you do get close enough to people to bond and they know you truly care and you provide that security and protection for them, then you get to dare them to be a better version of themselves. Now, I had this happen a few years back when we were building the company and I already had, a, a, had a, a significant leadership role, but the CEO of our company came to me and asked me to take over as president of our largest division. And my next comment was, are you nuts? And he said, no, if you look around, I kind of know what I'm doing. And I know you can do this. And he said the next thing that was the critical thing, but Ed, you've been an incredible contributor. If it doesn't work out, we'll find a place for you. I need you, and this division needs you. You can do it. So I had, he provided this caring and daring model for me that then enabled me to go in in 2004 as the president, which then enabled me and my leadership team to create this incredibly engaged workforce, enabling me to do what I do today. So if he had not dared me to be a better version of myself, I'm sure I'd be okay but I don't think I'd be here today with you guys talking about the things that I'm talking with you about. So this is what unleashes potential. If a lot of us have the mentality, if we care too much, it becomes caretaking. And it, it's not the model we're talking about. It was not about enabling people to stay where they are. 
It's creating that bond where they're free to turn off that negative mind and play to win. And you're there to catch them should they fall. So let me wrap up this section here. This is a, just a simple, another graphic of the caring and daring, where the caring creates the safety, the daring provides the risk. Now I have, I have looked all over for a lot of videos, different videos, to find a great example of what secure-based leadership looks like. And I just cannot find a better version of this. So the quick intro into this video is in 2009, Ted Kennedy Sr., former senator of Massachusetts, passed away from brain cancer. Same thing that John McCain passed away with, by the way. Um, at his funeral, Ted Kennedy Jr. did a, an, a eulogy. If you know anything about the Kennedy family, a lot of tragedy, right? But Ted Kennedy Jr., at the age of 12, had bone cancer and had to have his leg amputated. And he tells this story of what happened one winter day in D.C., and I'll let him tell the story. Let me turn off the lights. But this is the most profound example of secure base I've been able to find. Today I'm simply compelled to remember Ted Kennedy as my father and my best friend. When I was 12 years old, I was diagnosed with bone cancer, and a few months after I lost my leg, there was a heavy snowfall over my childhood home outside of Washington, D.C. And my father went to the garage to get the old flexible flyer and asked me if I wanted to go sledding down the steep driveway. And I was trying to get used to my new artificial leg and the hill was covered with ice and snow and it wasn't easy for me to walk. And the hill was, was very slick. And as I struggled to walk, I, I slipped and I, I fell on the ice and I, I started to cry. And I said, I, I can't do this. I, I said, I'll never be able to climb up that hill. And he lifted me up in his strong, gentle arms and said something I will never forget. He said, I know you can do it. There is nothing that you can't do. We're going to climb that hill together, even if it takes us all day. Sure enough, he held me around my waist, and we slowly made it to the top. And, you know, at age 12, losing your leg pretty much seems like the end of the world. But as I climbed onto his back and we flew down the hill that day, I knew he was right. I knew I was going to be okay. How many are touched by that video? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wonder what the mother was thinking, right? That's one, the first thing that came to my mind the first time I saw this video. And the other is, how easy would it have been for Ted Kennedy Sr. to have said, that's okay, you just got the artificial leg not long ago. We can do this another day. How many of us would have caretaken him, enabled him to stay where he was? But he gave him a bullseye transaction. I know you can do this. And if it takes us all day, we're going to do it. But he was there for his son as a secure base. And I just believe that this is our calling as leaders, whether you're leading one person, a hundred people, or leading yourself and becoming a secure base leader for yourself, but then becoming a secure base leader for other people. All right, last principle. Leadership is in the eye of the beholder. What does that mean? How many remember this? Let me dim the lights real quick so we can see a little better version of that. This was about four years ago. How many see black and blue? How many? See, oh my gosh, I think I've shown up with my tribe. How many see gold and white? How many see other colors? Because I didn't see some hands go up. All right. Why, how is it possible, besides the fact that this is an optical illusion, how is it possible that you and I can look at this slide, look at this picture? I see white and gold. Show me the blue and black hands. Blue and black. There is no blue and black up there. I'll, you know, I'll arm wrestle you. There is no blue and black. So how is that possible? Well, again, it comes back to the brain. The brain actually doesn't know fact from fiction. This is why your beliefs are so important too, by the way. Your, your brain is only going to do what you tell it to do. And it doesn't know how to decipher fact from fiction. See, our eyes see in two dimensions. And our brain is trying to make sense of the world around it. Because why? It's wanting to keep you safe. So it will, it will literally lie to you. 
There was a program a few years ago, and I think you can still get it on either Netflix or, or Amazon Prime, um, called Brain Games on Nat, Nat Geo, Nat, National Geographic. I see some heads bobbing it. If you can go find it, I encourage you to watch a few ep- episodes, and you'll discover what we're talking about here, about how you and I can experience the exact same event, but come away with two completely different opinions about what transpired. How many of you have sat in a meeting and had a conversation, walked out, and we walk to the water cooler, and I start telling you my perceptions of the meeting, and you go, Ed, were you in the same meeting? Has that ever happened to any of you in this room? Yeah. What causes that? Our values, our beliefs, our perceptions, and my former mentor prior to Dr. Cole Reeser, uh, Dr. Roger Berkman, the creator of the Berkman Method Assessment, says not only is it our perceptions but it's our misperceptions of how we're seeing things and experiencing things. So a few years ago, I was doing a project in Phoenix and I went to lunch with the SVP that had hired me, came back to the building, and there had been a horrific wreck at the intersection of the building. And uh, we walked over to the security officer and asked her what had happened. And she had been an eyewitness and she told us her version of the story. But then without prompting, she said, but the other eyewitness on the other side of the street had a completely different version of the accident. There's an organization called the Innocence Project that seeks to overturn wrongfully convicted felons, especially death row mur- uh, convicted death row murders. 72% of the first 120 overturned convictions, the original conviction was a result of faulty eyewitness testimony. There's no such thing as reality. It's how you are looking at things. So just understand that, which then says, what's the importance to leadership is Your version of leadership and your version of leadership and your version of leadership may be completely different. So how we show up as leaders affects people. And let me give you another really good example of how our perceptions can create misperceptions with this video. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. That's right, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? And action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. (laughs) So, confession, the first time I saw it, I saw one change and went, did that actually change? I wasn't quite sure I had seen what I saw. I'm not going to ask anybody if you saw changes or how many, but here's the point. What caused us to maybe miss all those changes? What? Where you focus. We, prim- we did what the FBI does. We primed you. Solve the murder mystery. So you were thinking and listening to the detective, right? So your focus, your field of view was very focused on solving that murder mystery. So the, the lesson for us as leaders is how do we come back up and get a bigger, broad view and also understand the motivations of other people from other perceptions and perspectives versus just our own. So, in fact, one last thing about the video. That's a a commercial for 
uh, uh, cycling in, in, in UK. The la latest one they did last year, they had some guy on a bike riding through London naked. So the Brits have kind of warped sense of humor. They're kind of crazy. They'll put stuff out there, but this, that video is awesome to, to demonstrate this thing about we focus on what's important to us and we, how much do we miss. And so Ken Blanchard's organization, uh, the guy that uh, wrote the One Minute Manager back in the 80s, uh, did a study last year that said 54% of us use and activate one style of leadership and one style of leadership only. So here's my question to you. If you're only using one style of leadership, how's that working for you? Do you really know what the people that you're working with need from you and expect from you? So um, Dr. Berkman, I want to give him the credit. We've all heard of the golden rule, right? What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you'd have do unto yourself. So I'm always careful because that's actually a verse in the Bible. <coughs> But, God, we got a better one. Sorry. The platinum rule, which is do unto others as they would want done unto them. And so when we put this into context, if you're familiar with Dan Goldman's work on social-emotional intelligence, I like his 1999 book, Primal Leadership, the best, because this is where he introduced the concept of situational leadership and these six leadership styles. If you have a Harvard business subscription or know somebody, the most widely read HBR article ever is by Goldman and several other authors called Leadership That Gets Results. And it goes into detail about these six styles of leadership where they actually quantified the positivity and or negativity of these different leadership styles. So I'm, we're not going to do a deep dive and have you rate yourself today, but this is something I would encourage you to take a look at and think about. You know, what is my number one? And, and by the way, um, Dan Goldman and, uh, and, and George are very good friends. He told Dan that the authors of the 99 book, or excuse me, the publishers, made him use the authoritative word for that style. But he now realizes that was a mistake. And so we've added that he believes it's truly a visionary style of leadership because authoritative is just too strong of a word. It sounds like it's too top down, too autocratic, when it's really not. It's really... That, that leadership style that mobilizes people with a vision. So if you're, I would, again, encourage you to take a look at this, get some, and if, if yeah, see if you can get some more information, buy the book, the 99 book. It's a great book. All right, so those are the three leadership principles. Leadership begins with your beliefs. Leadership is 24-7, 365, and leadership is in the eye of the beholder. And again, this is what has come back to me over and over and over again from people that really are looking to go to that next level in leadership, no matter where you are now. The last bonus thing I want to give you, I guess it was seven or eight years ago, I was doing a talk to a SHRM group in Louisiana, and I put up a slide of 13 years of Gallup data on employee engagement. And I said, anybody have an observation? Hand goes up. Nothing's changed. When exactly? And I said then, I said, so I'm curious, and I have a lot of respect for Gallup. I think they do amazing work. I said, I wonder if we're asking the right questions. If they're still saying that 30% of the people, uh, only 30% of the people in companies in America are engaged, are we really measuring the right data? And then not long after that, I found this study from IBM that helps us understand how we get a following and what really is the number one driver of employee engagement. Now, Truth, IBM set about to actually dispel Gallup's data. I think it's a yes and. For me, I, I think Gallup's data is relevant, but I think that this particular attribute that IBM study referenced is really the key. And what they have, they discovered that the number one driver of employee engagement is leadership future vision. Do you have a vision for yourself? Do you have a vision for your group, your department, your company? If you do or if you don't, why would anyone follow you if you don't have a vision? But this is the number one driver because then people can say, I love where you're going as a leader. I want to be part of that. Or they'll select off of it. So my encouragement as you look at leadership future vision if you've never done any mission, vision, value, values work on yourself, it's a phenomenal exercise. 
I spent a year and a half in the early 90s using Stephen Covey's model of imagining my funeral and people going up from four different groups and speaking about me to come up with a mission statement of changing the world one life at a time. So I just encourage you to take a look and do you have your own personal, personal mission and vision? So as we wrap up, let me give you this from another one of a person I deeply admire. Um, I actually got to coach a guy last month in Switzerland who was involved in, in, in a lot of the underground movement in South Africa when they were trying to overturn a lot of the apartheid and things that were going on. Nelson Mandela served 27 years in jail and he came out preaching reconciliation. But this is his incredible comment and quote on vision. Action without vision is passing time. Vision without action is merely daydreaming. But vision with action can change the world. Again, I look, I've looked for examples of great visionary statements. And I played one from the Kennedy family. I'm going to stay with the Kennedy family for our closing video. And it was just uh, it was 1962 at Rice University when John F. Kennedy delivered this vision statement. We meet in an hour of change and challenge in a decade of Knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. We shall send to the moon. It's hard. 
but an incredible visionary launch. And we got to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing just this summer. So it happened. That was 1962 at Rice University, and they landed on the moon in 1969. So this is a, a prime example of a leadership future vision. The le last thing I'll leave you with is this. Some of you may be familiar with Posner and Kuzis and the leadership challenge work that they've been doing for the last 30 plus years. Six editions of this particular book. And we use that model at my former company, the division I ran. But here's the takeaway, and the last thing I want to leave you with. They were asked once, if all the research you've done, if you had to define leadership in one word, what would it be? So let me ask you very quickly, one word to define leadership, what would it be? Trustworthy. Influence. Influence. What else? Influence. What Posner and Kuzza say ties back to secure-based leadership. They believe the one word is relationships. And if we understand our brains, if we understand that there is this deep need for each of us to belong, to be loved, to be cared for, to be affiliated with people like us, and also I would encourage you not like us, mm -hmm. to learn the other side. So thank you very much for the time today and listening to these three leadership principles and the bonus on what truly drives employee engagement. You've been a great group. Thank you.